Hi, Dr. Monroe. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Um, I'm okay. <laughs> you okay. Good. Good to see you. It's always good to see you all. I miss y'all every day. I miss you. <laughs> I think I'll give it a minute. Okay, I think everybody is in. <clears throat> I wanna welcome everybody and um, thank our sponsors first. This presentation is co-sponsored by the DC Archeological Institute of America the Howard University Center for African Studies, the Howard University African Studies Department, and the Howard University Archaeology Working Group. Many thanks to all of you for supporting events like this. Um, I am Dr. Flori Bagiran. I'm an associate professor in the Department of African Studies here at Howard. And prior to being in the African Studies Center, I was a faculty member in the anthropology program at Howard. <clears throat> During that time, I had the privilege to first meet, mentor, and work with Dr. Shayla Monroe when she was an undergraduate student in our department. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce her. Um, I'm very excited to hear about her research and where she is at the moment. Um, just to give you an idea of her background, Dr. Monroe is a postdoctoral scholar in anthropology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. That's where she received her MA in 2015 and her PhD in 2021, both in anthropology. <clears throat> she began her career at Howard, um, where she earned a dual degree in anthropology and English in 2012. And during that time, she had a lot of archaeological experience. So she worked at the Best Farm Slave Village in Frederick, Maryland, with the National Park Service in 2010 and 2011. Um, she was also my lab assistant, um, worked with me in the Howard University Montague Cobb lab on the archaeological collections from um, Kunta Kinte Island in the Gambia and Nicodemus, Kansas here in the United States. Uh, Dr. Monroe specializes in faunal analysis, the social zoo archaeology of Sudan and Egypt, and the archaeology of African pastoralism. Her dissertation analyzed the acquisition of cattle at the ancient Egyptian colonial fortress of Ascot and its implications for cultural contact and asymmetrical power relations between pastoralists and non-pastoralists. Since 2013, she has worked as an archeologist at the third cataract of the Nile River in Sudan, first at the Egyptian colonial site at Tombas and then at the Kerma hinterland site Abu Fatima, a site also located in Northern Sudan. Dr. Monroe has also received a number of prestigious awards. She is a Eugene Cote Robles Scholar and a recipient of the US President's Dissertation Year Fellowship. She served as a graduate mentor to underrepresented students um, at the University of California, Santa Barbara, um, which led to helping to foster an ethnic, ethnically and culturally diverse campus. <clears throat> so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shayla Monroe. Um, she will be talking about ancient pastoralists and ancient sites, the political ecology of the Nubian Sea Group on ancient Egypt's Southern frontier. Shayla Monroe. Hello everyone. Special, special hello to all my bison. Um, I miss y'all and I miss Howard every day. <laughs> um, let me share my screen so we can get started. Hooray, it looks good. <laughs> the right screen. Yes. All right, we're ready to go. I'm the last. 
<laughs> okay. So today I'll be talking to you about the political ecology of an ancient military uh, frontier. <clears throat> so who am I? Um, Dr. Bagarin graciously already introduced me. Um, I am a graduate of Howard University, the real HU. I am a, let's close this, an Africanist archaeologist focused on pastoralism, climate change, and social networks. And my region of specialty is the Nile Valley and the Sahara. And my fondest hope is that one day I can expand into the Sahel. And these are pictures of me. Um, I'm in a hole, uh, <laughs> which is actually a Napatan tomb in Tumbo, Sudan. And um, my Nubian colleagues decided that it was time for me to have some coffee. So they lowered down some coffee in a bucket so that I could drink coffee in my hole. And the other picture is um, me, um, I think I'm at Jebel Barkle in front of some rams hanging out. So I, um, as Dr. Bagarin already said, I got my bachelor's and my um, bachelor's in anthropology and English in 2012. I did my master's at UCSB in 2015 and I finished my doctorate in 2021. So what do I do? I, um, I do funnel analysis. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's just a method of identifying and quantifying the species present in archeological assemblages. So people give me all the critters, I count them up. I say, um, you know, I tell them what's there. I tell them, you know, which species are present, what the profiles are, whether there are males or females, whether they're young or old. And uh, we gather as much data as we can from um, the animal bones that are present. Sometimes you kind of hear this referred to as zooarchaeology, and they're used interchangeably, but oftentimes when we start talking about zooarchaeology, um, it, it sometimes describes what we, excuse me, it sometimes describes what we do after funnel analysis. When we take all of that data and um, apply it to larger anthropological and archaeological concepts, um, what do the results of this analysis mean in terms of cultural practice and historical events and human behavior? And so we use, you know, the methods of final analysis and the theoretical interpretations in zooarchaeology to shed light on um, how people use animals within human relationships. And in this case, um, in the case of my dissertation, I was using funnel analysis to kind of look at the larger geopolitical struggle between um, Egypt and Karma in ancient times. So as a zooarchaeologist, my primary focus is on cattle. I am very interested in the features of cattle pastoralism that are unique to the continent of Africa. And I'm also very interested in how the acquisition and the rearing and the exchange of cattle affects intergroup relations. People use cattle and they have used cattle for thousands of years for all types of social and political aims. So cattle uh, can be a resource, cattle can be a currency and um, using cattle in this way um, can actually affect the outcomes of intergroup relationships. So why the Nile Valley? You know, I'm a little bit biased, but I think the Nile Valley is one of the most amazing places to study the dynamics of ancient cattle pastoralism. And one reason is that cattle pastoralism was so important so early in the Nile Valley. Um, the people of Pharaonic Egypt um, were crazy about cattle, and they also looked to Nubia and Kush to acquire this um, resource in addition to breeding programs that they had within um, the territory of the pharaonic state. And you know, sometimes um, Egypt would acquire cattle from Nubia and other areas um, through exchange in, in through complicated, complicated trade networks, et cetera. Other times uh, these cattle were taken via taxation. <clears throat> And there were also a few times when cattle um, trans was transferred from Nubia to Egypt by force, um, such as the um, 
military cane of the Egyptian pharaoh Snefru, who um, is recorded as having returned to Europe from Nubia with 20,000 head of cattle as the spoils of war. So Egypt was not the only place in the Nile Valley, in the ancient Nile Valley, where people were kind of crazy about cattle, um, just like me. Um, if we look at Kerma, which was the um, state, the expansionist state to the south or upriver from Pharaonic Egypt, it was um, the capital was located on the left uh, on the left bank of the Nile River near the Third Cataract, and it began to develop around um, 3500 BC to 1550 BC, which um, pretty much led to the collapse of the Kerma state after a prolonged war with uh, Pharaonic Egypt. Um, so Kerma um, also shared with Egypt uh, this uh, emphasis and a um, kind of a, a cattle-centered way of thinking. And so what you see here in this picture is an example of the display of cattle bucrania or cattle skulls that would be arranged on top of the royal tombs of the Kerma family or the Kerma royal family. Um, one tomb, um, and this one, this might be the tomb, um, had 4,000 bucra uh, bucrania affixed around the top of uh, the burial chamber. And so here is a map and this little circle shows you where the Karma capital was. So all in all, you can see why someone, an archeologist who loves ancient cattle and loves um, all the social and political dynamics that come along with ancient cattle, uh, cattle would be really, really happy working in the Nile Valley. So in between Egypt and Kerma, you have um, what is, uh, or what was um, frequently a contested uh, landscape. So I know that this map is a little bit fuzzy because I got it from a very old book, but I will um, show you a clearer map of what we'll be discussing. The little dot, that you see in the purple circle is the Egyptian fortress of Asku. So at some point around the year, uh, I guess around um, 1600, um, probably a little bit before, the tensions uh, build between e Egypt, Kerma and non-state actors. So I just mentioned these two monumental civilizations, Pharaonic Egypt and ancient Kerma. But um, from my point of view, as someone who studies pastoralism, some of the most interesting developments in the Nile Valley come from the non-state actors. And so a lot of attention has been, a, uh, has been given to ancient states, but ancient states um, constantly interacted with smaller groups that weren't states, but played a role in regional development. So when tensions build between Egypt and Kerma, the pharaohs of Egypt um, commission a series of fortresses that are built in the second cataract region. So the local Nubians who lived in the second cataract region appeared to be unaffected by the presence of the fortresses. It seems as if their settlement patterns and their ways of moving through the landscape did not change that much initially um, when the fortresses uh, were erected. So, um, Documentary evidence mentions that the residents were acquiring cattle from local herders. When I started my dissertation, as you shall see, I wish I uh, had paid more attention to this evidence. But the big question that I had when I started to study the, the faunal remains at Asku, I wanted to know in this border region between these two monumental ancient states, I wanted to know how cattle affected the relationship between the groups of people coming into contact at that border. So you have some people who are just love cows in the north and you have some people who love cows in the south. I want to know, um, you know, cattle as an increasing commodity, cattle as something precious, cattle as a resource that people sometimes fight over. How is the exchange of cattle actually affecting the relationship between um, all of these different actors? 
So um, I acquired the osteological remains of animals excavated at Askut. Now, Askut was excavated in the 50s, and these remains were housed at UCLA. Um, and so Askut was an Egyptian fortress, one of these Egyptian fortresses that was erected at the Egyptian Nubian border. Um, the political dynamics between castle, um, cattle pastoralists and non-herding meat-eating populations in ancient societies was one of the things that interested me. I wanted to know, you know, what happens between powerful people who want meat and people who may be politically less powerful, but they have these cattle herds that these other people are seeking as a resource. And specifically, I wanted to know if we could see herd management strategies that protected reproductively valuable animals from exchange. That sounds really complicated. I essentially wanted to know how old were the cattle that were being traded into these fortresses. So people are coming into the fortresses, um, colonial Egyptians are coming into the fortresses. They're acquiring meat from local people. And when we look at, um, cattle herders and when they supply non-herders, cattle herders have certain aims in which they wanna keep certain animals for themselves. Reproductively viable females um, are almost never traded out in exchange for anything. Um, animals that are too young, animals that um, have you know, a long reproductive future ahead of them are almost never traded out. So the idea is that when you see a group of people acquiring animals from herders and they're getting young tender animals, they're getting reproductive age females, it may indicate that they have some sort of asymmetrical power relation over um, the herders because the herders are giving away animals that they would rather not. Um, they would rather uh, give the animals away according to their natural culling patterns so that they don't damage the reproductive viability and sustainability of their herds. So for me, the story of cattle in Askut um, began long before Askut and the Second Cataract Fortresses were built, much to my uh, <laughs> the chagrin of my advisor who wanted me to kind of get to the point and I completely understand. I um, love talking about cows too much to get directly to the point. I didn't want to jump right to the point. I really wanted to root myself in um, kind of the deeper meaning and the deep, I wanted to kind of theoretically orient myself in the decisions that pastoralists make and how those decisions are related to a variety of circumstances. And I kind of wanted to put down roots there before I jumped into what was happening between herders and non-herders at Askut. So for me, the story of cattle consumption at Askut is intertwined with all the reasons that cattle became crucial to the survival of people in Northern Africa and beyond. So if you will indulge me for just a moment, I'd like to just give you the cliff notes version of kind of how I see this story from the beginning. So we start off, we have, um, <laughs> I said the beginning, we have wild animal management in the Sahara. So way back in the day before the Sahara was actually a desert, people in the Sahara experimented with domesticating animals. Um, People tried to uh, domesticate wild Barbary sheep, which are here. Um, it did not work out that well. Um, the sheep did not want to be domesticated. Uh, <laughs> and so from what we can tell from archaeological records, they used to gather the sheep in caves and they really tried to make these sheep like domesticated sheep. But these are different than Ovis Aries, which um, has um, more of a genetic tendency towards domestication. The Barbary sheep were just not going. so. That experimentation didn't really work. Um, these animals never got used to humans. Now, something that was a little bit more intriguing was wild cattle management. So wild cattle, uh, before the introduction of those tourists, uh, we're talking about the African Arocs. So out in the Nubian desert, people experimented, experimented with kind of herding and trying to manage these wild cattle. It did not necessarily lead to cattle domestication at the time, but it testifies to this deep, long relationship that people 
and both had, and now right now we're dealing with both, both primogenius Africanus, but the relationship between human and boss goes back um, about, from what we can tell to about 12,000 BC. That's when we start to see these Northeastern African cattle of human populations kind of fixating on wild cattle. So enter Bostaurus. Um, Bostaurus enters the African continent around 7,000 BC, but things really start cooking around 6,200 BC. Uh, in the Eastern Sahara, we see this a, a change in culture that's kind of fixated on cattle. cattle. We see rock art, uh, and we see that people are um, growing their um, domesticated cattle herds, are spreading all over the place. They're concentrating around the Lake Chad system. They're concentrating in the Fazan. And more importantly, these people with these cattle are kind of moving back and forth around the Sahara. And they're moving in between the Sahara and the Nile Valley. So pastoralism spreads, you know, after these um, um, domesticated cattle um, kind of start to like trickle in from uh, the Sinai Peninsula, you see that domesticated, uh, domesticated cattle spread rapidly and wildly across Northern Africa. And that's probably due in part to this previous relationship of both um, reverence and attempted management and experimental domestication that um, African populations had with both primogenius Africanus before both Taurus. So after this comes um, something that David Wingrow and colleagues calls the primary pastoral community, where we can see this influence of these Saharan herders first in the Southern Sudanese portion of the Nile, and then they start to spread upward towards Egypt. So this phenomenon of cattle keepers coming into the Nile Valley, they're influencing ways of self-decoration and display. And here um, you start to see a series of relationships between dedicated herders and early farmers. And this um, pattern kind of leads to the pre-dynastic and the proto-dynastic. And you see this pattern, this constant pattern of herder farmer contact throughout the development of Nile Valley complexity. And so this primary pastoral community was like a shared heritage um, of the people of the Nile, kind of located um, right in the middle, the middle Nile Valley, um, before the nations of like Pharaonic Egypt and Kerma existed. So here is a map that looks a little bit loony, but I made it myself because this is me trying to understand the long history of farmers and herders in contact right up until the point that the C group becomes archeologically visible. So if you look from early times through like the pre-dynastic cultures of the Bedarian, um, they were in contact with herding um, peoples um, called the Tazian. And then you go through each phase and you have these primarily farming complex polities. And when we talk about the development of, of complexity, in the Nile Valley, we tend to privilege the story of the farmers. So we talk about the Bedarians, we talk about Nakata, we talk about pre Kerma, but we speak less and we kind of focus less on these primarily pastoralist cultures that were constantly in contact with these farming cultures. And when we do that, we kind of erase the role that pastoralist communities had in the development of Nile Valley complexity. They're kind of left out of the, the um, picture of, you know, of development of complexity over time. So because of this, you know, long history of herders kind of interacting with Nile Valley uh, agricultural communities, I, um, this kind of takes me back to the core of my research, which is pastoralist decision-making. Um, we have the, the, the desertification of the Sahara, the spread of the Sahara, um, 
placing a set of circumstances on these pastoralists and they have to make decisions as to how they're going to deal with climate change. And so when climate change requires a response, how do pastoralists decide collectively what to do? So when we speak about culture and climate, um, it is um, difficult for some people to talk about. You know, we have entered a time in which it's uh, critical conversations about people and culture and climate are long overdue, but people are sometimes hesitant to talk about these things together because anthropology and some other related disciplines, there were certain decades in which we wrongly got, uh, dominated these conversations with a type of vulgar materialism. Um, and by vulgar materialism, we kind of, um, there was a time when environmental determinism was kind of rife in its explanations of culture and climate. And these views still linger in some places, even though anthropology has by and large moved away from environmental determinism. But these views kind of saw a very, uh, they saw culture as a very simplistic adaptation to climate conditions. Um, that is not how most anthropologists see it anymore. Um, that's not really how environmental archeologists see things anymore. Um, and that's definitely not how I, you know, see culture and climate. Much of what one experiences and navigates, um, um, excuse me, much of how one experiences and navigates climate can be culturally contextual. So it's not that climate is creating your culture per se, even though, um, it has certain things to do with it. You know, you have to survive where you are, but your culture determines how you experience climate. Because when you have to solve problems in your environment, it's from your kind of cultural worldview that you think, okay, well, what are our options? You know, what is possible? Like what possible solutions can we find to this problem? Or what's un what is taboo? What is unthinkable? Yeah, we could do that, but that's gross or that's weird or that's sinful or, you know, there's consequences to that. Our culture kind of helps us navigate the ways in which we can respond to um, environmental duress. And that's how powerful culture, culture is. And so unlike, you know, animals who are operating largely on biology and instinct, the ways that people inherit and operate um, within landscapes that are imbued with the imagination of our ancestors, that is a powerfully and specifically beautiful, you know, it's a human thing and it's beautifully human. So animals can kind of respond to climate based on instinct and based on their needs. Humans have this whole other level of thinking about our environment, you know, as a landscape and also um, having, you know, a ton of different factors coming into play and, and you know, uh, that help influence or constrain how we can respond to environmental duress. And you can also see instances where two different cultural groups can share a geographical environment and a climate, and yet they make different decisions and also create different landscapes in which they operate. We see this in the Nile Valley. You have periods of thousands of years in which hunters and herders and farmers are living side by side, navigating a similar landscape, but they have very different ideas about the best way to survive that landscape. So in addition to culture, having an, uh, a distinct influence on how you're able to solve your problems and navigate your environment. Politics also have an effect. Same with one's cultural view, the power dynamics between groups of people in your landscape can influence and constrain your decisions and your actions concerning how you respond to your environment. Maybe you do want to go to that river over there, but maybe there's a bigger group, a stronger group. Maybe if you go over there, they'll beat you in the head or whatever, or maybe this river is not as strong, maybe it doesn't have as many resources, but you know, 
you know, her grandmother was cousins with your grandmother. You actually have the ability to go over there and be welcomed as kin and, you know, um, not be oppressed. So in addition to your culture, the politics of your landscape, especially if there are other groups of people living in your landscape, that affects what you are able to do when you are trying to solve the problems of surviving your landscape. So to put this all together, you have your culture, you have the environment you live in, you have the power dynamics between you and other groups of people, you have your own political structure, which determines how you and your group of people make decisions, and you have your social networks. And these social networks, as we see with the Sahara, can you know, span thousands and thousands of miles. So climate doesn't make people do things. All these factors work together to create a set of circumstances that people have to navigate. And under these circumstances, people as individuals or in groups weigh their options. And according to a calculus that is situational and culturally contingent, they make these complex decisions. And right now we call this a political ecology. This term might be temporary. I hear it's already fallen out of favor with some adjacent disciplines. Um, archaeologists and anthropologists have done this in the past under different names. And some of those um, former frameworks didn't really work well for me because I felt like they didn't take um, power dynamics and uh, intergroup politics into account enough that kind of like satisfied me in terms of what I needed to do in the Nile. So next year or next week, we might call this something else, but this is where I am rooted. This is where my research questions are rooted. And so when I think about the problems and the choices of African pastoralists, past, present, and future, this is how I as an anthropologist and an archeologist and an environmental archeologist, excuse me, this is how I try to understand what they're going through. So when we get back to the story of these herders who are living in the second cataract region and interacting with colonial Egyptians, this is my point of entry and this is how I am trying to understand the position of the Nubian Sea Group. So I am probably gonna stop right here and explain the term Nubian Sea Group. Um, it's always something that has to be explained. It is um, a problem that we are working to fix in Nile Valley archeology. span so in the early days of Egyptology, when archeologists were trying to understand the pre-dynastic, the succession of pre-dynastic cultures um, that I just previously mentioned, the Badarians and um, the different phases of Nakata, they noticed that there were some material differences between people living right on the river and people living in the dry lands adjacent to the river. And so immediately it, it looked like there was a series of kind of riverine actors and there was a series of kind of peripheral actors and um, the riverine actors, the ones that were seen as direct um, antecedents or, or excuse me, seen as like directly ancestral to um, pharaonic Egypt they were given the names, you know, Badarian and Nakata, and we they eventually become like the pre-dynastic and the proto-dynastic. Those that were seen as separate were, um, some of them had names uh, that were, you know, based on other things, but they were just called uh, A group, B group, C group, and then eventually X group. Then later on, it turned out there was no B group, so we were left with an A group and a C group. Um, and they have never been, um, we haven't gotten to the point where we are giving them um, proper names, but that is something that I and other Nubiologists have been thinking about working in conjunction with descendant populations. And it's something that we hope to rectify soon, but we've become way too comfortable with it. So I just wanted to mention that because um, we are very comfortable with each other, like saying like A group and C group. And it's not until we're in a discussion with people outside of Nile Valley archeology span that people are like, that sounds wrong and weird. And, it, and that is absolutely correct. It is wrong and weird, but we haven't fixed it yet. So bringing all of that together, 
um, we come to the region of Wawat. So the Nile Valley can be broken into three main segments along its length. You have the lower Nile, the middle Nile, and the upper Nile. And um, there are different climates and different environments, excuse me, there are different environments along the Nile. And each of these regions has, you know, um, advantages and disadvantages in terms of producing food. So this area kind of in between the lower Nile and the upper Nile contained Wawat and several other smaller little cultural regions. And this kind of zone that exists in between like the centers of power as they develop, um, the area um, known as Wawat was a an area that was frequented and you know was um, inhabited by the Nubian Sea Group. So this map um, was created by a scholar named Henriette Hafsas, and I took it and modified it for my own purposes. Hers was much prettier, but this shows you where Wawat was. And if you look at the little squares, these are the second cataract fortresses. So. The people living in this region, and you have Nubian Sea Group people living all through this region, they were living there first. And then Egypt and Karma started beefing and Egypt built these fortresses in this region where these people were already living. Um, and the name Second Cataract Fortresses is a little bit misleading because as you can see, these fortresses kind of spread out beyond what is considered the Second Cataract. Um, sometimes they're called the lower Nubian fortresses, but that's also a little misleading because it makes it seem like it was Nubians who built it and not Egyptians. So this was something that the Nubians living there had kind of put on their front door. So um, archeological evidence shows that the economic sphere of the Nubian Sea Group had multiple components. They're stereotypically known as pastoralists. They are described by the ancient Egyptians as pastoralists, but it was actually only one part of their economy. They had kind of a pastoralist way of thinking. Everything is cows, their, their, their sculpture is cows, their pottery is covered in cows. So they're kind of like this um, prototypical cattle culture um, that eventually over time kind of lost their cows. So initially the C group was not the focus of this dissertation. Initially, I was just looking at how Egypt and Kerma were interacting in this middle sphere. But the more I started to read about the C group, well, first let me say they became prominent once um, I'll show you my disk data and realize that I couldn't really um, get the Egyptian and Kerman data that I wanted. And it turned out that the data I actually had was C group data, which was a little bit of a surprise. But once I started to read about the Nubian C group, um, the stories about them were so interesting. Um, they were known to like um, hijack caravans that were traveling through the trade routes. Um, they would you know, kind of hijack these caravans and like take the luxury goods and these luxury goods that they hijacked from these caravans have been found like in their burials. So the Egyptians did a lot of complaining about the sea group, um, <laughs> but they also hired the sea group as mercenaries. So, you know, sometimes the Egyptians would talk about the sea group as if, you know, they had a contingent of like goons in their society. And other times they would use the C group as mercenaries and kind of like the muscle of their imperial arm. And then you see other stories about how um, there was a complaint in the New Kingdom about the C group stealing some cattle from um, an Egyptian fortress, but it turns out that they only stole the cattle that the Egyptians had stolen from them first. So like you start to read the stories about the C group and you understand that it's written from a biased perspective because it's written from the Egyptian perspective about their pesky neighbors. But you can't help but root for them. I honestly, I felt I kind of fell in love with them because they were plucky and resilient and, you know, just kind of full of spunk. And I was like, you know, this is my kind of carrying on when you think about it. So even though I was upset initially that I didn't get. Um, I couldn't really pinpoint Egyptian and Kerman data the way I wanted in this region. I ended up really liking um, the Nubian Greek 
uh, C group and studying them. And I thought, hmm, these people actually sound a little bit more interesting than both Egyptians and Kermans. So um, this is Askut, and I'm going to kind of wrap this up because I'm, I feel like I'm running out of time. So um, this is Askut. Askut was the Egyptian imperial fortress. It was built on an island near the second cataract. Um, and over time, this fortress changed purposes. It started off as a military gar garrison, and then it became kind of a center for trading between Egyptian and Kerman families that were occupying um, this kind of liminal borderland space. Um, first it was occupied by military and then it was occupied by colonial administrators from Egypt. And it was built like the other fortresses right in the middle of sea group territory. Um, so I wanted to look at changes in provisioning. I wanted to know who was bringing meat into the fortress and how that changed over time. And Askut is unique because even though it was created as this fort, it later became occupied by re residents of various ethnic groups. And as, you know, regional power kind of, uh, you know, toggled back and forth between Egypt and Kerma, um, you see that all kinds of people have kind of taken to this fortress. And that gives us a really interesting look at, you know, how foodways change when, um, you get a chance to kind of look diachronically at different groups of people living in the same place. And so Askut emerges as this multi-ethnic settlement that is supported by this hinterland and the C group herders are in this kind of region that is supporting the settlement. So my initial research questions were, you know, where, um, oh, that should be, were. It should be where the cattle consumed at Askut local or centrally distributed. I wanted to know if Pharaonic Egypt, if the state bureaucracy was actually putting these cattle on cattle boats, which was a thing in Pharaonic Egypt, and sending this cattle upriver to um, provision the soldiers at Askut, or were the cat, were the, um, was Askut actually getting the cattle locally as was documented by Trigger? So I thought the cattle might be local. They might come from Egypt, the North, or they might come from the South. They might've been traded in from Karma. I wanted to know if it changed over time and if that change had to do with the, the fortress changing from a military structure to a non-military structure. And then I wanted to know what I could tell from the age and sex profiles of the assemblage, whether females being consumed, um, or whether young or old, or whether males being consumed, whether young and old. Um, I used uh, osteometry and biometric analysis. I wanted to use um, stable isotope analysis, but we have some issues with doing that on cattle in this particular region, um, or at least we did when I wanted to do it. Um, that type of analysis should be um, more feasible soon. Um, so I measured bones and I measured bones looking for the recorded differences in generalized skeletal morphologies of cattle populations in ancient Egypt and ancient Kerma. Simply put, that means the ancient Egyptian cattle, by and large, people who have studied them and measured them have noted that their measurements, they are tall, they're big bodied and they're robust and that shows up in their skeleton. Um, ancient Kerman cattle are tall, leggier and more gracile. So what that means is even though there's a lot of variation in general, if you put the, the skeleton of an, Egyptian, an ancient Egyptian cattle next to one from a similar time period in Karma, one of them is just gonna be thicker and more robust and the other one's gonna look leaner, but they were both large, um, they were both large on average. Um, so for sex profiles, um, also using bio, uh, biometry, which is just measuring bones and morphological traits to assign biological sex to specimens and looking for that normal culling pattern. Are we seeing lots of young males, which means that the herders are giving up the animals that they would wanna give up anyway? Or are we seeing animals outside of that culling range, which means that herders might be um, coerced or forced into giving up more valuable animals. Um, and so also we, I wanted to look at the zooarchaeology of military frontiers. I wanted to compare the bones at Asku with um, bones that have been studied by other zooarchaeologists at other ancient military sites. 
And one of the ways of doing that was looking at the ratio of transport and security animals to food animals. How many horses, donkeys, and dogs are there compared to cows, sheep, goats, and pigs? So the results of the first one, just really quickly, as you can see, I had um, very few transport animals. Um, oh, for some reason, um, yeah. So I only had like 13, um, dog, um, excuse me, 13 donkey or horse specimens and I only had six dog specimens compared to 700 cattle, 600 uh, caprines and 20 pigs. That means that this fortress does not look the way fortresses in Southwest Asia look or fortresses in Rome look. When you look at other military frontiers, you see a lot more transport animals. So Ascoot was immediately not like other fortresses in the world. There were too few donkeys, horses and dogs um, to kind of make it, you know, kind of align it with other fortresses. But the way I interpreted that is there's this rivering element to pharaonic Egyptian infrastructure that makes the assemblage look different. The Egyptian state used the river to its fullest potential in terms of transporting everything, including military personnel and supplies. So when you look at places in Southwest Asia and Rome where people have done similar studies of military fortresses, what you're seeing is that they relied more heavily on overland transportation and um, uh, therefore you, you clearly need more donkeys and horses rather than um, a site where people are primarily using the river. Sex profiles were horrible. I don't even wanna talk about it. <laughs> Um, but I only had about eight or nine elements that were appropriate for our measuring um, sex. So I didn't really get to do like the sexy profiles um, that some archaeologists do and they're able to show like, oh, we had this many males and this many females. I just didn't have enough uh, viable uh, diagnostic elements for that kind of um, analysis. And so then we get to the real tragedy because I wanted to know whether these cattle were big Egyptian cattle or initially I wanted to know if they were big Egyptian cattle or whether they these long lean Carmen cattle. And as I measured element after element after element, Ascoot shows up at the bottom of every chart. These cattle were teeny tiny little cattle. They weren't tall and big bodied. They were not tall and gracile. They were short and they were shrimpy and I ain't gonna lie to you, I did some crying because I was trying to figure out, <laughs> you know, where, um, where on this kind of like morphological range these cattle fit and they did not fit in the range at all. So, you know, so this is like uh, measuring humeri and I didn't have that many, but if you look at the Kerman cattle and you look at the Ptolemaic Egyptian cattle and you look at the Ascook cattle, the Ascook cattle were smaller in every category that I measured. And so if you look at this one, um, this is one of the toes. So this is one of the phalanx dimensions. Um, the Ascook cattle are down here in the corner in this green circle. The measurements for both Karma and Egypt are up in the top corner. So that means that the cattle that I wanted to find in Ascook are not there. The only cattle I could find in Asku were these tiny little cattle that had been raised in the area. So this meant that I had to kind of center the C group and refocus. I wasn't dealing with Carmen cattle coming in from the South and I wasn't dealing with Egyptian cattle being shipped in or by boat. I was dealing with the cattle that were being raised in this harsh environment around um, the fortress. And so, I had to refocus on the C group and the economic importance of cattle. Um, the cattle were a secondary form of currency that the C group had. They, they normally traded with the Egyptians and Kermans in gold, but they also could use cattle as a secondary form of currency. Um, also climate change. During this time, the Sahara is still getting larger and the climate crisis, um, I wanted to know if it was driving C group to kind of liquidate their malnourished cattle. We don't really see, we see that the age profiles look good except during the second intermediate period, but that's hard to interpret because a lot of people were having really hard times during the second intermediate period. Um, and so for those of you who don't know, the second intermediate period is one of the periods in which um, the state apparatus of pharaonic Egypt was undergoing intense reorganization 
Um, and so the state apparatus wasn't really functioning as a state. And so power was kind of decentralized and um, some people had hard times. There was some violence. This is the only period at ASCU where the herd profiles looked like people were just seriously struggling. And so that's something I haven't really followed up on, but outside of the second intermediate period, it doesn't look like anyone was really taking advantage of the, the C group. Um, and so this entire thing, you know, the measurements not being what I wanted them to be, cattle did not seem to be imported from Egypt or Kerma. So I had to kind of pivot in the middle of this dissertation and refocus on the C group and Wawat and um, refocus on, you know, triggers. He doesn't elaborate, but he just mentioned several times that um, the fortresses in this, um, in this region were supplied with cattle by um, the Nubian C group. So focusing on that, um, the new questions at the, at the end of the dissertation are why um, there should be cattle, why are C group cattle smaller? You know, how is it that the Egyptian cattle are huge and the Kerman cattle are huge and the C group have these tiny little cattle? And that goes hand in hand with how they might have survived the harsh climate of the Batan al Hager. So Batan al Hager means belly of the rock. And so this is sometimes how people describe parts of the second cataract region, especially the part around Asku. So what it seems is that these um, C group people were raising these cattle in a very harsh environment. And there are a lot of reasons why that might lead to these cattle being so much smaller than the cattle in Egypt, Egypt or Kerma, where they had all these resources to nourish and feed um, these cattle and also to breed them with deliberation so that they were larger and um, aligned with Egyptian aesthetics and Kerman aesthetics, which might've been slightly different. Meaning that the Egyptians bred these big beefy looking cattle, beefy looking cattle, because that's um, something in their art and in their aesthetic that that was their ideal. They had an ideal cattle type for cows. Same thing with Kerma. Kerma still, they had many different types of like face shapes and not all the cows looked alike. You can tell even within Kerma territory, the reg their regional types of cows, but it also seems that the Kermans in their art, the long leggy cattle was also an aesthetic ideal. Like, so in both places, these um, state apparatus, they might have the, um, pardon me, sorry about that. Um, they might have the, the means and the resources to breed cattle that look beautiful to them. Whereas in the Nubian Sea Group, they're out in the margins in a harsh environment and they're not able to breed cattle that large without water and resources. So that takes me right back to um, political ecology. So now that we're pivoting to the Sea Group, um, we take those same... Um, factors that I was for, uh, you know, that I mentioned earlier, culture, environment, power dynamics, political structure, and social networks. And we use all of that to try and understand, you know, whatever we can about how the C group is surviving, how they're using cattle um, to navigate this inter-imperial region between expansionist Kerma and expansionist Egypt. And, um, try to actually understand all of these factors, how all of these factors work together to produce the circumstances under which they have to make these decisions. And that is it. Thank you. That was wonderful. That was so informative, Dr. Monroe. No. Um, <laughs> Um, now we can open the floor to anybody who has questions. I'll, I have a few questions, but I want to let everybody else go first since I am ready. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Monroe. Uh, my name is Reggie. I'm an independent researcher, Reggie Mabry. Um, in the uh, Nubian C group, uh, do you include? I, I can't. I can't hear. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay. Hi, Dr. Monroe. Uh, I'm, my name is uh, Reggie Mabry. I'm an independent researcher. So I have two quick questions. Uh, one in the Nubian uh, C group, uh, do you include the group called the uh, uh, the Tamu? 
a tambo tamu tam who the tam um these no so it, are you are you saying t e m e n h u yeah well yeah it's a uh, it's t h m m w or m u tam who these um, are the groups of people who are uh nubian types they wear feathers they have they have a southern uh group and they have a northern group and so these are some of the groups that the ancient Egyptians are biased of. And so they control the Western desert. So neither the Nubians nor the Egyptians could cross the Wadi Hawar or go anywhere unless uh, fighting them. So Harkouf and uh, Winnie talk about them in the early uh, ages as uh, when Harkouf comes down to uh, do his, uh, his, uh, his travels he he sees the Nubians fighting this group called the Tamhu. And so those are, uh, so my question was, uh, do you include uh, them? Because you can't go to Chad or any of those places without meeting uh, these groups of people who, I, so I wanted to see if you type them as a uh, Nubian, uh, uh, Nubian Sikh. Um, so I'll move on to my next question. So my next question is, okay, so in ancient Egypt, uh, they begin at some point separating their uh, cattle um, in religious and cultural uh, ways. And so they have the uh, black cattle, which is chem. They have the white cattle. Uh, they have the red cattle, the desert, right? And they have the uh, sob cattle, which is the mixed cattle. So they have the hedge, the chem, the sob. Do you see any of the, can you tell any of the groupings? I know the language is a little, uh, uh, sketchy in that in the Nubian area uh, group C, but they they but they, of course they uh, begin writing. Do you see any sacredness uh, separating the cattle? Okay, so to your first question, um, it's very very tricky. So there were lots of descriptions of Nubians that I did not include in uh, the Nubian C group. So in my mind, um, the the group you're talking about that um, Temahu. I, in my mind, even though I don't write about them and that's not my, my area, I had them more closely aligned with the, the Libyan groups. And so when I speak about the Nubian C group, it's only things that I can kind of like, because there are many different Nubians, it's, there's kind of a process I have to kind of verify that I'm talking about the right group of Nubians. So th those, um, the uh, Temenu were not, included um, because in my mind, they're more closely related to what are normally described as Libyan related groups. So I didn't, they're not in this, <laughs> they're not in this particular analysis. And in terms of the, the different types of Egyptian cattle, um, there is a, I just read a dissertation about Egyptian cattle breeds, but with those, um, I don't necessarily know if there's a skeletal difference so much as a focus on coat color. And so with the focus on coat color, um, we probably would not be able to, well, not probably. I can't look at a skeleton and tell the coat color. Now, sometimes we, in the Nile Valley Preservation, we do get hide fur and things like that. But here, I'm only really looking at the dimensions of the bones that I can measure. And so when I just look at, okay, all I have is a bare skeleton and I can tell how thick the bones are, how long they are, and also the shape of them, because the shape sometimes um, is different. Um, and based on those measurements, the C group cattle, interestingly enough, they only resemble Wadi Hoar cattle. Those were the only other group of cattle that have been measured extensively that look anything like these cattle. Um, speaking with Nadja Palaf, um is on my to-do list um, so that I can actually get more of her measurements and I can start to do a statistical comparison between the C group cattle and the Wadi Hoa cattle. All I know is that I wanted Egyptian cows and I wanted Kerman cows and that's not what I got, so. <laughs> yeah. So I do agree. I'll stop. Uh, I do agree that the Tamhu and the Chichenu are uh, often uh, 
put in the Libyan groups, but they have a, a southern uh, a group um, uh, next to Ab Abydos, Abdu, right on on the in the Western Desert, um, and so I think the categorizing of them uh, uh, with the Libyan groups is 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 something that uh, people need to uh, revisit. But thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. And I, and I will say this: when we talk about group categories. Anthropologically speaking, group categories are messy. So any responsible anthropological archaeologist is kind of not using a grain of salt, but is being very cognizant of how many mistakes we have made over the past hundred years saying, well, this is one group of people, this is another group of people, only to go back and look at new evidence and be like, ah, these actually look the same. So we are... Um, we're cautious and we're judicious when we talk about these group categories in the Middle Nile Valley region. Thank you. I don't know who to, <laughs> you, you can pick another person. Um, there are a few people with their hands raised. Um, Dr. Monroe, do you want to just? Uh... Okay, um, so, Sophie Miller. Hi. Um... Thank you. So I just want to say, Dr. Monroe, thank you so much as, as someone who is, not only did I teach today on domestic cattle for my uh, class, but also in finishing my own dissertation um, on something very similar, but so that was incredibly fantastic presentation. And it's really lovely to hear the kind of pastoral complex being talked about as being so foundational to kind of a lot of Egypt, which can often be talked about as being such a discrete unit from things like the cattle complex. Um, I also apologize if my microphone is hot garbage, by the way. But um, so I, I have a couple of questions, but, but primarily I wanted to ask if you, with your data, were able to look at um, within site social stratification or access. So um, you talk about kind of provisioning as a, as a form of power. Um, and I'm really interested if you were able to uh, ascertain kind of within site dynamics. I'm thinking of something similar to like the Giza Workers Village in terms of access to um, like young cattle and veal as a form of social stratification. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if you were able to find that. And then also if there would be value for your looking at cattle as smaller in uh, drawing on things like rinderpest epidemic data uh, in terms of small bodied cattle and, and how that could impact it. Shayla, are you still there? She seems to be frozen at the moment. Maybe she'll log back on in a second. Um, I'm actually down the hall from her. I can go check and see if there's a connection issue. So I will be back in a moment and see. Oh, there she is. Yeah, I am so sorry. Y'all, Bessie gives me no warning <laughs> when she's about to die. <laughs> I, I, I apologize. So Sophie Miller, you your question, right back to you. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. I, I didn't realize you'd cut out. Or, uh, yeah. Um, I, I asked if, if your uh, data was able to give you resolution about within site social stratification and power and for cattle access. I'm thinking of like Giza's workers village in terms of access to veal and provisioning. You talk about it like provisioning into the site. Is there a level of stratification that you're able to get at within the site? Um, yeah. No, and, and you know, my advisor and I talked about this a lot because um, he did his dissertation analysis on Askut. It was like a little city inside. It's a very large fortress. But in terms of the food refuse, um, meal sharing, there are some areas like at, at the beginning during the um, military garrison phase where you can see, okay, this is clearly like commandant's quarters, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, the way that people inside the fortress were sharing meals and then discarding of the remains of those shared meals made it so that I couldn't really get at that kind of um, differentiation the same way you might in a settlement site where you can look at a large house or an elite household 
and compare that to a smaller household. I didn't have that kind of resolution. Okay. Um, Gula, you Barry? Uh, uh, yes, how you doing, uh, uh, Dr. Malro? I'm fine, thank um, you. Uh, no problem. Um, I was I was uh, on the ask uh, uh, to kind of kind of back off the question like of uh, the, the Tamahu earlier. Uh, in your in your mind, uh, for us the C group, I know it can I know it can be kind of murky a little bit, you know, uh, for us saying like who the people are. But in your mind, uh, would you consider them some like people that will be related to like the Bija, the Somali type, or like the Gash groups that would be like around the Red Sea area? Uh, people or, or Cushitic, Cushitic uh, speaking groups? So, um, let's see if I can distill this. Um, I think that there, there was, um, I consider, in, so in my mind, I have a cluster of people that share a Saharan heritage. And that's partially because I'm looking at the movement of the cattle during the desiccation of the Sahara. So on the Western desert, um, so yeah, it gets confused when we talk about the Egyptian Eastern desert. So over on that East side, the side between the Nile and the um, Gash, I think that's one set of related people. I think that the Kermans, the C group, pre-Kerma, Wadi Hoar, and to an extent, the early Egyptians, they're um, from a different Saharan milieu that's coming out of the Wadi Hoar. Um, now, if you are interested in the language groups, Claude Reedy has a theory that the C group, after their archaeological disappearance, they didn't disappear, but they become archaeologically indistinct because of assimilation into Egyptian culture and other things. He has a theory that they, number one, spoke um, a Nilo-Saharan language that was related to that of the Kermans and everybody else coming out of that Wadi Hoar diaspora. But he also had a theory that the C group went to the Gash later on. So um, Rudolfo Fadovich and Claude, really there's a, a couple of people who have proposed the idea that the C group actually ended up in Eritrea. Now, the last time I talked to Claude, he, he was less sure than he was a couple of years ago. <laughs> Archaeology will do that to you. But um, that's something that if you're interested in the language groupings, that's an interesting conundrum because according to Claude, he thinks that, that they are a Nilo-Saharan group that ended up with um, the, the uh, people over towards the Red Hills, Red Sea Hills. Yeah. Yeah, that, that 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 makes a lot of sense because even in that area, you got a lot of uh, Nile Saharan and Afroasiatic entanglements. That's like uh, like you said in the Eritrea, you got the you got the the Nora and the uh, Kanema people, and then like you got the uh, Butana group who would have spoke probably Nile Saharan and the Kerma. Kerma would the Kerma Kerma uh, Kermitians, they probably, probably would have been uh, even though they they had a Nile Saharan base, they probably would have uh, of course been intermarried with Afroasiatic groups in a mix. You know, saying had like they probably borrowed you know. Almost like a borrowed from uh, each other's culture, living in those same regions, and being neighbors. Hey, so Claude's got some stuff for you to read. Okay, <laughs> um, let's go to um, the love of my life, Natalie Pierre, Doctor Doctor Natalie Pierre. <laughs> Dr. Monroe, I am fangirling, and I am so glad I have you on the text message group chat. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. All right. So uh, I, I, I want to thank you for this phenomenal work that you're doing to expand our understanding of internal African diasporas in ancient Africa. Because as a historian of the modern period, I'm always trying to emphasize to my students African people on the continent migrated on the continent for commerce over political, military strife, et cetera, et cetera. And the fact that you're doing this through archaeology leads me to my first question. Can you talk to us a little bit about the actual method of dating these 
primary sources. I'm a historian. I, I art, <laughs> artifacts. I don't know the language. Help me, sis. So that's my first question. Uh, just walk us through how you do this faunal analysis. I think you um, is is the is the phrase you gave earlier. My second uh, question is: Can you tell us more about these? Uh, these Nubian sea group caravan pirates. Uh, I'm just curious. So please, thank you so much for your work. Uh, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so the first question in terms of dating. Um, so depending on the type of material you work with, you can do, um, you can perform uh, radiocarbon dating, which is a method of directly dating the artifact um, so you're looking at the, oh Lord, I have to explain this. Um, you are looking at the, um, the rate of decay in which certain elements in the artifact break down. And by using a standard rate of decay, you can calculate how much of that decay has occurred since the uh, artifact was deposited in the ground. You can't do it on every single material, but you can do it on um, bone. So often we will pick certain bones in an assemblage. And so with archaeology, everything is about context. So you can pick, you, you let's see, oh my God. When you excavate, you excavate strategically so that you keep all of your context separate and you label them meticulously. And then you strategically date artifacts from each context so that each context can get what we call an absolute date which is a date that is taken, um, you know, are um, uh, extracted through the radiocarbon dating process. Then you also have associative dating. And that's where uh, people like my advisor and like my colleague, uh, Emily Smith come in, because they can look at ceramic types and um, other types of artifacts that change form over time. So they can look at those artifacts and tell, you know, during which era and which period those artifacts were manufactured. Those artifacts are also collected very strategically with uh, their context uh, meticulously recorded. And so we call that provenience. So everything we find on an archeological site, we do a lot of writing and a lot of paperwork and a lot of digital recording to make sure that we know where everything comes from. And then we use a combination of different dating um, techniques, including the absolute dating in which we're using um, AMS and radiocarbon dating. Um, with pottery, um, we can use things like uh, thermoluminescence. There's a whole different types of um, dating inorganic materials like pottery. And then um, we have the associated dating. So normally we're using a combination of dating techniques and refining it to get as close as we can. And then in 10 years, when someone comes up with a brand new uh, calibration curve or <laughs> or something, we have to do it all over again, no. <laughs> but the science behind this absolute dating is constantly evolving. And so we do, uh, we get it as close as we can. And then when the science uh, becomes uh, more refined or when people come up with more accurate techniques, we calibrate everything that we dated before so that we can get it, um, we can um, get the date uh, we can assign things to the most accurate date. Um, now, in terms of the Nubian Sea Group, I love talking about them. I talk about them for hours. But uh, essentially, they were uh, a pastoralist non-state actor, and they're an approximate other. So what that means is they come into they come into the Nile Valley. I, off the top of my head, I want to say around um, twenty eight hundred. Um, BC, and there was a group that was there before them, the Nubian A group. Um, the Nubian A group was expelled. Um, they got into a big fight with the Nakata, the, the third phase of Nakata. They were expelled. Later on, they, they're out in the Sahara somewhere. Um, and later on, a group of people that looks a little bit like them and has pottery that's a little bit like theirs, uh, later on, a group of people comes back that's acting a whole lot like their grandchildren, but we're not really, <laughs> we don't really put it like that. Um, and they were not just marginal to Egyptian and Kerman culture. We think that they were 
uh, related to Kermans. It looks like one of their homelands was in the Dongola Reach, which later became a Kerman stronghold. But Nubian Sea Group people were also integrated into Egyptian society. There are enclaves within Egypt, Pharaonic Egypt proper, where we find tons of Nubian Sea Group material. Um, Nubian Sea Group people were integrated into Egyptian culture as soldiers, dancers, uh, hairdressers is another thing. Um, so we find bits and pieces in the Egyptian historical record um, referring to um, these people. And they also, um, like I said, so you have the, the C group people within Egyptian society, you have the C group out in Wawat and in the, the desert area, they were um, also known as mercenaries uh, during certain, certain periods of Egyptian history. Um, they were pretty resistant to um, certain types of Egyptian aggression. And so at times they were getting along and at other times Egypt was pretty heavy handed with the Nubian Sea Group. But at the end of the day, it's approximate other. So even though you can read about Egyptian perspectives on these people, you're reading the state perspective of people who don't always wanna pay taxes, don't really wanna be occupied, um, raiding caravans, taking luxury goods, stealing cattle back that got stolen from them. So I think it's a little bit entertaining because I tend to look at the Egyptian record. I'm a Nubiologist. So I tend to look at the Egyptian record um, from a Nubian perspective. So it's funny to me. I, I, just, <laughs> I think like watching the Egyptians get annoyed by a C group activity is kind of entertaining and funny <laughs> because it's also like, yeah, how much do you are you really annoyed by them? They're they're living inside your, you know, <laughs> they're living inside your space. Thank you, Dr. Monroe. Okay, so let's do um Emily Smith. Sorry, my setup is all sorts of messed up right now. Um, and my webcam, unfortunately, is not existent on this computer. So I apologize for that. But Dr. Monroe, Dr. Dr. Monroe, I loved your talk, um, by the way. It's it's wonderful. Um, Thank you. I just have a really quick question uh, because due to time constraints, you had to shoot past it really quick. Um, on your slide, we were talking about uh, the selection process for males. You had a little line called bad boy bogue behavior that you did not clarify on. And I have that with a series of question marks after it in my notes because I would love it if you could go a little bit into detail about what do you mean by bad boy bovid behavior? Bad boy bovid behavior. Bulls destroy things. Bulls are destructive, not even just bulls. Bulls, goats, rams, um, you know, any, anybody in the Bavadai family that turns into a grown male and gets a little weight on them will knock your house down. So um, pastoralist societies do not keep a lot of male, grown males around. Um, those males are called between two and three years of age. So during around two to three years of age, they get enough weight on them so that they can make a good meal for people, but they're still young enough that they're, they're not knocking houses down. And, you know, as a side note, you, if you go watch some Tony Baker videos and you see that 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 is bad, bad boy bovid behavior. So it's really a practical measure. So what you will pick out is you're going to pick out your breeding males because you're going to need some bulls to fertilize the females. And you're going to um, if you have a farming component to your culture, you want some oxen. So when you castrate the males at age two to three, they grow up. And um, they're, they're shaped a little bit differently, but oxen can oftentimes turn out to be stronger, physically stronger than bulls. So um, they make good traction animals, good transport animals. Um, and also there's a cultural element, because if you look at some Nilotic cultures and some East African pastoralist cultures, they celebrate. Um, so a lot of cultures celebrate bulls as being like ultra masculine. But um, my mentor, uh, Diane Gifford Gonzalez, told me that sometimes when they're doing like these dances where they're celebrating like 
the masculinity of bulls, they're really celebrating the masculinity of the ox because oxen can control itself. So when you think, when you're looking at the behavior of male bovids, sometimes people perceive it as like, oh my gosh, a ram is like awesome. Or a bull is like awesome, it's very powerful. But other people culturally conceive it as like, that is an animal that cannot control itself. You know what I'm saying? So um, that's what we mean by bad boy behavior. And that's why the culling happens um, generally two to three years before these things are just, you can't have too many bulls run around. They'll just tear up everything. Thank you. That was really enlightening because um, especially when we're talking about how you know, certain you know, ones are known to be able to have more self-control than others. Um, you know, it has, it has some interesting, I'm going to, I'm going to chew on that a little bit because of the connections in Egypt between the Pharaoh and the bull. So if there's also the, some of these connotations of bulls are, <laughs> bulls and, can't be trusted. And what's the bull doing? On the and north, what's, the, what's the bull doing? It's knocking down a wall. That's what I'm telling you. Yeah. So that, that's, that's <laughs> interesting, you know, other uh, uh, implications that I'm, I'm going to chew on. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, Jonathan Owens. Hello, Dr. Monroe. Can you hear me? I can. Wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm glad I, I, I got a wind of it. I have a, just a few short questions, particularly about uh, C group burials and bucranium found in C group burials, whether they fit the profile. Did you say Oskut? Uh, am I saying that correctly? Mm -hmm. Oskut. Uh, whether they fit the profile of uh, bovine or cattle from the Oxa area, or if you even got to uh, actually look at any of the, I'm pretty sure you have, uh, but uh, some of these Bucranium found in C group uh, burials. So um, most of the information I have about the C group burials comes from some of the zooarchaeological work of uh, a woman named Dr. Pernilla Bangsgaard. And so the C group burials were, a lot of them were excavated by uh, the Scandinavian team and uh, they were recorded. And so according to Banksgard, um, there weren't, so, so the, the ritual, the, the burial ritual that the C group shares with uh, Kerma in that you have like this elaborate ritual in which the person is buried, there are sheep and goat elements in the burial, then it's covered and then the bucrania are put on top. You find far less of those in C group burials than you do karma burials. And it might just be a difference in wealth. So I have actually never excavated a, a C group burial. I have, um, um, I have excavated Kerman burials that were uh, built upon the same model. Um, so I am not sure. I mean, if if you wanted to find out the, the measurements or the description of those Bucrania from the C group, um, from the C group burials, they would probably be under the SJE in the SJEV, SJE volumes, which are the Scandinavian volumes that recorded um, a lot of the C group data. Mm -hmm. So all I will say is that she noticed that there weren't as many Bucrania as with Karma. Not probably not because they didn't want to, but probably because they just had less, um, th they had smaller herds and they, they didn't have the same amount of cattle wealth. I appreciate that. And just in closing, I'll ask, what do you think that, because my ultimate question is, would they, try to be buried with Bucrania uh, of a cattle from their herd? Or was that an item that one would go and collect afterwards uh, just to make sure that all the sacred items are in uh, one's grave? And thank you for your questions and your time. And I appreciate it. That's my last question. So what we think happened in Karma was that when someone would die, because a lot of in, in Karma, what we see is we see the, the most prolific um, uh, Bucrania displays are for royals. So what that means is that they might have got together and had some sort of a cattle feast or cattle slaughter. Um, the bones from the neck down got buried in a separate place. And then you save that Bucrania uh, for the, um, 
for the grave. Now, mind you, as I mentioned, uh, or maybe I didn't mention, this idea of the Bucrania goes back to before domesticated cattle. So um, while there are rocks or oxen in Africa, Apparently there was, you go and hunt when someone dies, you go hunt an RX in and you get the skull and you put it on there. So I would think that it would come from their herd. Um, there is with animal burials, there's a certain type of economic sacrifice. And so um, Pernilla Banksgard has a theory that the um, sheep and the goat that go inside the grave, well, the goat is kind of for food, but the sheep kind of represent a living community and putting that that cow skull on the end um at the um on top of the grave because that's at the end of the burial process that might be a way of signaling an, an ancestral community so these these animals are used in different ways and then you have the sheep which is you know this is our our living kin and then at the end of the burial process, you do something else to kind of signify your ancestral uh, or the connection to your ancestral kin. Now that is a, a theory that um, she has, and that's you know something I've been meditating on and, <laughs> and thinking about deeply. Okay. All right, my brother, uh, Salim. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, Dr. Dr. Monroe, thank you so much. And, um, you know, like you, I enjoy um, C group Nubia. Um, it represents the heterogeneity of the Nile Valley. It shows that it was not homogeneous, right? There were different uh, people's cultures and groupings and so forth. So um, what, what, what I want to ask you, I remember um, the, the last Nubian Studies Conference that we uh, attended um, in, in Paris, uh, David Edwards did a lecture laying out the strategic gold mining and other uh, rare gems in mining that were concentrated within C group settlements. And so your presentation, it just struck me because I, I was sitting there watching it like, wow. So most of the, the gold and the other strategic metals were in among C group settlements. And you, you indicated um, that the C group cattle type was distinct. It wasn't like Kerma. It wasn't like uh, uh, Egypt either and so forth. So my question is, number one, have, and you also mentioned that there were C group burials in Egypt proper as well as in Kerma, right? Which is one of the things that's amazing about this culture because they stand alone in Wawa. They also in uh, Kemet or Egypt and they're also in, in, uh, uh, in Kush and Kerma and so forth. So I'm wondering, for C group burials um, discovered in e Egypt proper, right? Was this distinct cattle type? I ha has it been identified in any of um, those barrels or settlements in Egypt? That's number one. Uh, uh, and then number two, my, my question is, I think for me, uh, considering where the strategic mines are located and then they have their own distinct cattle type, um, for me, in my work, it makes me think that they may not have been a state actor, right? But maybe they were state pretenders at times, <laughs> and they and they had they had the potential to be. And the Egyptians certainly saw them as that type of threat, like the the famous Sobat Nak description, which says that Wawat, Kush, and Punt were a part of a federation during the second intermediate period that had the power uh, to invade in Egypt, and in fact they did, right? And so I'm wondering again. Could 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 they pose as you know these uh, potential state actors being in a region uh, with their distinct cattle, the mines, and have any of their cattle been found uh, uh, in Egypt? So, but again, thank you so much for your CSI esque presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is this is an interesting question. Thank you for the question. Um, so one, the the twist at the end of this dissertation where I thought everything was ruined and horrible was that my advisor, Stuart, pointed out that there was a, when, when the slide where I showed um, that the Askut cattle were just so tiny and they, they, they weren't, uh, you know, anywhere close to the size of the, the, the Kerman and Egyptian cattle, there was another little dot next to it 
of another group of equally tiny cows. And, um, you know, thank God for Stuart. Stuart said, oh, well, those other tiny cows, that's a C group enclave in Egypt. So there's the twist is that you have down, you because remember I told you there are these Nubian C group enclaves within Egypt. And so I'm sitting there crying during a pandemic because I don't know what to do about these tiny little cows. And C group, and, and, and Stuart was like, no, no, no. Because you got tiny little C group cows here and you got tiny little C group cows up in the, the site of Adaima, which is close to Hiram Kampalas. And so he was like, if you look, both of those tiny little sets of cows are both in C group territory. And so this gave me enough to kind of like salvage some meaning out of this. Um, and um, now I'm really thinking about, you know, whether we can um, make, uh, you know, further connections by, you know, finding, you know, uh, where in these enclaves we can see a different cattle type. Um, but, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. And I um, need to add in some other elements like LSI scaling and, and things like that to make it a little bit more accurate. But the second thing in terms of the non-state actors pretending to be state actors, I'm saying this because, you know, there's some discussion about how complex the Nubian Sea Group actually was. Um, we don't really use the word paramount chiefdoms anymore. You know, even as we come away from those schema about, okay, well, you have a chiefdom, you have a paramount chiefdom, and then you, you know, you have a state. Um, there were some people who always made the argument that the Nubian Sea Group was almost a state because you could recognize paramount chiefdoms, which in that old schema was like the last step before you had full like centralization and a full on like bureaucracy, et cetera. You know, and I think now we recognize that it's a little more messy than that. So maybe I should preface by saying, you know, just like with these, these groupings where we don't want to play fast and loose, we're, we're flexible with the idea that, you know, at the time, um, I don't know if they were like, oh my gosh, we, we need to, you know, check off our list so that, you know, somebody in the year 2022 calls us a state, but um, they were considered, or they're also referred to as an active periphery, right? So I don't like to think of them as a periphery because we're trying to move to seeing them on their own terms, but they're called like Egypt's active periphery because they're pushing, they're, they're acting, they're shaping how, you know, and, and forcing Pharaonic Egypt to respond, um, you know, in all of these ways. The caveat though, and, and I'll leave with this, is the idea of how do you centralize what is essentially a pastoralist and segmentary uh, structure. I know I'm playing fast and loose, but there are so many things about the way the Nubian C group was set up that strike me as stereotypically segmentary because their survival kind of depended on a political flexibility and a physical flexibility. So Jeff Emberling talks about karma as a pastoralist state in this idea that how do you get a bunch of cattle herders to congeal into what looks like an ancient state? Um, so to me, that would be the challenge when thinking about incipient or maybe kind of sort of statehood with a group like the Nubian Sea Group is pastoralists by nature, they move on the fly in so many ways in terms of their politics and their decision-making apparatus has to be flexible. So the question is, you know, can we talk about that pastoralist, the political uh, flexibility of pastoralists as a state, which we tend to think of as a static centralized concentration of decision-making power. I didn't mean to go off on a theoretical tangent, but that's <laughs> just kind of where I'll leave that. Do you want to say any closing remarks before we end? Um, I, I haven't read, did, do we get to everything in the chat? Because I've kind of not. <laughs>
I think most of the questions were actually posed by people raising their hand. So okay. Well, and, and the only closing remark I'll say is that if I have made any mistakes, um, those mistakes were mine. <laughs> and as I always say, if, if, if I did anything right, you know, that is due to Stuart Tyson Smith and Diane Gifford Gonzalez. If I did something right, it was because of them. If I did something wrong, it was because of me. Um, <laughs> and also, um, I will continue this because she didn't think I saw her, but I saw Dr. Ashby making faces at me. So, uh, <laughs> so um, this is, um, this has been um, a wonderful opportunity. Like I said, I miss Howard every day. Um, and, you know, um, you can um, look me up on my website um, or um, on UC Santa Barbara's website, and I'm happy to correspond or answer any further questions. And hopefully I will see you again one day with some new research and maybe a few answers to some of the questions that I was left with you know, towards the end of my um, uh, um, dissertation. Yay. And I just want to say that this was truly an epic presentation that really um, impressed me, impressed Dr. King as your former faculty professors. We were just in awe and honored. It's amazing. It's, a, it's wonderful, Sheila. It's just really, really good. Yes, so I wanna thank you for your time and I want to thank you for all your insights and information and for sharing your knowledge with our audience. And for all the students out there, I want to highlight the fact that Dr. Shayla Monroe is a leading professor to actually look forward to and run to get any insights you can and mentorship from her in the future. So with that, um, I hope you guys all have a good night and thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Shayla. Good job, really good. Good night, everyone.